As we begin, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Maureen O'Connell for our Mary Field and Vincent D. P. Gabot lecture on women's contributions to church and society. She's currently the department chair of religion at LaSalle University and an associate professor of Christian ethics. Prior to her current position, she taught at Fordham University. Her undergraduate degree is in history and she received her PhD in theological ethics at Boston College. She's the author of Compassion, Loving Our Neighbor in an Age of Globalization, and If These Walls Could Talk, Community Muralism and the Beauty of Justice, the latter of which won the College Theology Book of the Year Award in 2012 and received the 2012 first place for books in theology from the Catholic Press Association. She also co-edited She Who Imagines with Lori Cassidy. Her current research project explores racial identity formation racism, and racial justice in Catholic institutions and higher education. She is a member of POWER, the Philadelphians Organizing to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild, which is an interfaith federation committed to making Philadelphia the city of just love through more just wages for workers, fair funding for public schools, immigration reform, and decarceration. Please help me to welcome her as she speaks about Howling Over the Sins in Which We Share, Dorothy Day, and Racial Mercy. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much um, for having me. I want to thank Sister Jen for extending the invitation and to folks here in the community who clearly give quite a lot of thought to this very robust programming that you all have. I'm only three and a half hours away in Philadelphia, and I'm thinking I could get up here on Sunday evenings without too much trouble to be with you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, Dorothy Day is somebody who can contribute to what's going on, I think, urgent issues in our contemporary context here in the United States around um, racial justice issues. I want to begin with a disclaimer and say that I am not in any way, shape, or form an expert on, on Dorothy Day. I just find her a really important resource. So if there are other folks in the room who know more about her, I suspect that there might be, given this robust intellectual community, um, please feel free to... Uh, to offer what you would know to sort of fill out uh, my presentation with you this evening. So in her column on pilgrimage in The Catholic Worker in 1943, Dorothy Day reflected on her visits to black communities in Patterson, New Jersey, where she heard tales of racial violence. Are these sins, are, the, are not these sins crying to heaven for vengeance, she wrote. And how can we do anything but howl over the sins in which we share? They are our sins. Just as we believe in the communion of saints, that we share in the merit of saints, so we must believe that we share in the guilt of such cruelty and injustice. Day has long been lifted up as an icon of American Catholicism even put forward for sainthood, a proposition she would more than likely resist if it were up to her. The Pope's acknowledgement of her in his address to Congress last September may or may not help that cause. But here's what he said. In these times when social concerns are so important, I cannot fail to mention the servant of God, Dorothy Day, who founded the Catholic Worker Movement. Her social activism, her passion for justice, and for the cause of the oppressed were inspired by the gospel, by her faith, and the example of the saints. Francis unpacked the significance of her life as one lived in the midst of financial crisis and economic hardship with an eye for those, as he called them, trapped in the cycle of poverty. And as such, Day is someone who reminds us, and I quote him, the fight against poverty and hunger must be fought constantly and on many fronts, especially in its causes. Since many believe that racism is America's biggest poverty trap, I was listening to that congressional address hoping for a particular message. All spring and summer, I had contributed to the efforts of the PICO Network, a national interfaith community organizing outfit started by a Catholic priest in California in the 1970s 
This group was trying to convince Francis through his closest advisors that if he wanted to address an economy of exclusion in the United States, an economy which he named in Evangelii Gaudium as the root cause of all of our social ills, an economy that kills, then he would have to help Euro-American Catholics like him to wrestle with the persistent legacy of racism in our country and in our church. As protests were breaking out in Baltimore over Freddie Gray, we were offering personal and theological testimony to Cardinal Rodriguez of Honduras about the wounds of racism needing public forgiveness. And just days before the shooting in Mother Emanuel AME in Charleston, representatives of, of the black clergy of Pico went to the Vatican to meet another member of Francis's advisory council, Cardinal Turkson of Ghana, asking him to ask his dear, France, his dear friend Francis to model for other Euro-American Catholics ways of encountering the pain of racial exclusion in order to become the muddied and bruised and battered church of the streets that he envisions. In the end, only at Independence Hall did racism come up during Francis's visit explicitly. Standing before a statue of President George Washington, for whom enslaved Africans labored in his household only blocks from that very spot, Francis said, the history of this nation is also a tale of constant effort lasting to our own day to embody those lofty principles in social and political life. We remember the great struggles which led to the abolition of slavery, the extension of voting rights, the growth of the labor movement, and the gradual effort to eliminate every kind of racism and prejudice directed at successive waves of new Americans. This shows that when a country is determined to remain true to its founding principles based on respect for human dignity, it is strengthened and renewed. It was not exactly the direct indictment of racism that many of us were hoping for, but nevertheless, Francis presented us with an imperative to remember movements which helped Americans be our best selves, an exercise as central to social change as it is to the Eucharist we just celebrated. Do this in memory of me. When read in concert with his address to Congress where he lifted up four particular American figures who embody those lofty principles of social justice and political life, and that remind us of our best selves as Americans and Christians, it is in these folks I believe we can indeed find our best selves in the midst of the legacy of the movements they led. And like any good feminist theologian, I think that we can go back into our tradition, albeit suspicious of its collusion with the racing of peoples of North and South America, to find important resources for alternatives to the way things are. So I want to spend my time this evening remembrancing, remembering in order to become like that which we remember, Dorothy Day. And I want to do so, think about Dorothy Day as a white female lay Catholic, like some of us in this room, who worked in her own time to probe and heal the wounds of racism in herself, in the church and in our culture. I want to make one caveat. There is a risk in Catholic theology and ethics where racism, racism is concerned to go the familiar way of focusing on white voices and white perspectives at the expense of a very rich history of Catholic leadership, prophetic witness, and theology from communities of color. To use a Marquette ethicist Lincoln Rice's words, I don't want to reinforce the worldview in which white European reflection is sufficient for all times and places, a temptation which I clearly succumb to in placing so many of my racial justice eggs in the, Fra in the Francis basket this fall. He is, after all, more European than many of us in this room. And yet I want to acknowledge the work that white folks need to do in order to undo racism. Folks like Dorothy Day, like Pope Francis, like me, and any other descendant of Europeans in the Americas. So to maintain that balance, I want to lift out how Dorothy Day's life and writing offer decentering alternatives to both white normativity and white approaches to racial justice work. I want to suggest that she does, does so through a concept that she never used explicitly, but we can see 
evident in her life when it comes to her engagement with what W.E.B. Du Bois called the color line. And that concept is racial mercy. So tonight, at the end of Black History Month and in the midst of the season of Lent in this Jubilee Year of Mercy, I'm going to remember in Starthy Day as an American Catholic who did not approach racism through the usual dichotomy of either charity that addresses its ongoing effects or justice that tackles its root causes. Rather, we might find in Servant of God, Dorothy Day, an approach to resisting racism steeped in mercy, the healing balm for the wounds of what Catholic theologian Brian Massingale, Massingale has called the soul sickness of America, or what Dorothy calls in her column back in 1943, the sins that we all share. And I think that Francis's ideas about sin in his book, The Name for God is Mercy, confirm the need for racial mercy. Sin is more than a stain, he says. Sin is a wound. It needs to be treated. It needs to be healed. So I'm going to do three things tonight. First, I want to explain why I think that American Catholics, particularly Euro-American Catholics like me, need to pause in this season of Lent with the passion on the horizon and step back from our talk of commitments to racial justice and instead ponder the possibilities of racial mercy. Second, I want to look at Dorothy Day as an example of racial mercy, the kind of stance that other white lay Catholics might take that is careful to strike a fine balance between make, making racism be all about us and accepting the responsibility for just how much racism, racism really is about us. And third, I want to use Dorothy Day's life to help us see the possibilities in the Pope's understanding of mercy for reshaping our approaches to racism, something that he also has not done explicitly, but for which implications are everywhere in his writings and his actions if we pay attention. So first, why racial mercy of upper rooms, locked doors, and wounds in need of probing? The more I learn about racism from the perspective of white dominance, ways in which the idea of race has worked to advantage some by deliberately disadvantaging others, the more I learn about critical race theory and its connection to every discipline in the Catholic intellectual tradition, particularly theology. And the more I learn about the impact of racism on our brains and likewise our imaginations, particularly our Catholic imaginations with our deep appreciation for materiality and embodiment, I'm convinced that my experience as a white Catholic in Philadelphia from childhood to the present can best be likened to that of the disciples locked away in the upper room after the crucifixion. White Catholics in the US are walled off from the reconciling joy of the resurrection because we haven't faced our complicity in the crucifixion of people of color in the US. We are paralyzed by our unquestioned confidence in what we think we know about racism in the echo chamber of our white-only conversations or predominantly white academies and boardrooms, high schools and universities, churches and governments. We are stuck in a mental space where we reject the need for healing out of fear of those we've harmed. We are hamstrung by our amnesia where the mem memory of Jesus's acts of loving the neighbor and forgiveness of sinners is concerned. And we're caught in the repetitive loop of history to which we are responding at best with inequality sustaining charity. We are blinded by our own judgments about the people on the receiving end of our charity and often anesthetized by our self-righteous anger when they are not sufficiently grateful. We're burdened by gifts we don't even know we have and often clueless to know how to contribute to movements of inclusion. We are choosing self-isolation in the suffocating anxiety of an all-white upper room of our own making rather than encountering the liberating mercy of the wounded and yet resurrected Christ in the people outside the door. Being stuck in this upper room of whiteness hinders the work we do towards bridging, blurring, and erasing the color line, no matter how good intentioned, well-meaning, or seemingly effective according to the standards we or the white institutions for whom we work set for us in this regard. Let me say four ways in which I think that whiteness messes with justice. First, 
By protecting us from pain, the upper room reinforces within us a sense that somehow justice is pragmatic where race is concerned, that we can somehow fix this race thing without having to rend our hearts wide open by coming face to face with anyone it harms or without turning to face the history of racial hate and discrimination in our families and in our churches. In short, the upper room falsely assures us that we can build the kingdom of God without having, in the words of liberation theologian Robertus Goizueta, without having to experience the wounded resurrection, to probe the wounds of the resurrected Christ. Without that knowledge, justice misses the subtle and yet weighty nuances of racism that wound the body of Christ today, nuance that sustains inequality that's built into systems and structures and also into hearts. Second, by keeping us in like company of people who know Christ, but who are uncertain as to how to follow the way where racism is, racism is concerned, the upper room gives us the false sense that white ways really are the best ways, that white knowledge really is the most comprehensive, that white analysis, or at least information run through white filters, really is the most accurate and trustworthy in the end. In the upper room, justice takes on the trappings of the enlightenment, one of the intellectual wellsprings of the very concept of race. Justice is a kind of moral calculus, a logical proposition, a set of theories and hypotheticals pondered and parsed, rooted in authority ensured by hierarchy, intoned re with rhetorical fervor, never really informed by lived and multicultural realities on the other side of the locked door. And so justice often rings empty and false on those ears. It is from the upper room of whiteness that we make appeals to justice through originalist interpretations of the Constitution, for example, interpretations which mean something quite different to the ears of those not recognized as full people by the slave owners who wrote that document, or those whose experience is measured against the cultural normativity of those deemed worthy to interpret it. Third, by providing a closed space that incubates fear, the upper room normalizes fear and tethers justice to that primary and suffocating emotion, cutting off empathy and choking creativity, both which are critical human capabilities for life in community. When tethered to fear, justice cannot involve outside the box or green light thinking. It is limited by questions of practicality, effectiveness, feasibility, accessible outcomes, political correctness, security, criteria that too often overpower the gratuitousness, the outrageousness, the abundance, and the surety of neighbor love, which is how Cornell West understands justice. Justice is what love looks like in public. And then fourth, by locking out whatever might be on the, upper, on the other side, the upper room separates us, not only from our neighbor, but also the vision that God has of us, a vision of us as broken and yet still deeply loved, even beloved people. Too often in the upper room, vision of self can go one of two ways, both of which keep us from seeing ourselves as God sees us and keep our gaze turned in on ourselves rather than outward, on the neighbor. On the one hand, life in the upper room tempts us to deny our brokenness and our sinfulness where racism is concerned, and so to miss the wounds in need of healing, whether in our own bodies or on those of others. So justice never really gets to the heart of the matter, the fundamental ways that we understand ourselves and each other. The other distortion in the upper room is to become so overwhelmed by our complicity in all of this woundedness that we become paralyzed and preoccupied with guilt and shame, which are reactionary and not reflective responses. Catholic ethicist Mary Elizabeth Hobgood claims that, individual, that the individual and collective drive to white dominance stems from the inability of whites for self-love, since in order to maintain racial hierarchies, whites need to constantly deny fundamental things about our own humanity in order to justify dehumanizing other people. So in short, in the upper room, talk of justice gets derailed, either with white defensiveness or with white fragility. So what I'm trying to say here is that before we can do racial justice, Euro-Americans need to first seek racial mercy, confess wrongs, 
name wounds, acknowledge failures, seek forgiveness, and express a desire to start again and again. And here's where Dorothy Day comes in. I think she makes several contributions to undoing racism through ideas of mercy that um, are instilled or infused in her own ministry. Um, so let me, let me lift up a couple of these for us to consider. First, I think it's important to note that Dorothy Day, as a Euro-American Catholic, went public with suffering, and perhaps more importantly, her own devastation about suffering. As testimony to her gradual process of moving from being locked in the upper room of whiteness to probing the wounds of the resurrected Christ to heading to the streets in discipleship, her own vocation had an evolution. It evolved from a socially conscious reporter with a distanced perch to observe social inequality and upheaval in her day to a sympathizer who goes to jail with others and converts to Catholicism in order to share in the experiences of the masses, to weeping herself with profound recognition of shared pain and suffering in the world. And it's in feeling this pain and weeping about it, lamenting about it on the pages of her diary and in the Catholic Worker that she was able to break out of the bondage of apathy and look for collaborators. From the earliest days of the worker, Day knew that racism made life unnecessarily harder for some people. And I think that's captured in this stained glass window that comes from somewhere in New York City. I was not able to find the exact location of the church, so I now have a new mission for myself in, in, new, in New York City, going on a pilgrimage looking for this mural or for this stained glass window. On Pentecost Sunday in May of 1934, Dorothy Day and Peter Marin attended an interracial mass meeting at Town Hall in New York City, an initiative of the National Catholic Interracial, Interracial Federation, which was spearheaded by Jesuit intellectual John Lafarge. And Lafarge envisioned local chapters of Catholics who would commit themselves to spiritual reflection on racism, to increasing cooperation and understanding among African-American and white Catholics, and to advance the cause of social justice and equality for African-Americans. This is 1934. This cooperation in Lafarge, Lafarge's estimation would dismantle institutional racism within and beyond the church in areas of education, education for clergy, fair housing, and employment. Lafarge had a very robust vision. That interracial meeting of about 800 people in May of 1934 featured a number of fiery speeches by Catholics, both black and white, who criticized the lukewarm gradualism of most American white Catholics regarding collusion in slavery and current conditions of segregation. Let us confess it, Paulus Priest and editor of Catholic World, Father James Gillis said, it is a scandal and a shame that it took Christianity 18 centuries to eliminate races, to eliminate slavery. According to Lafarge historian Daylord Southern, Gillis went on to say that anyone who participates or tolerates race hatred contradicts and crucifies Christ. Almost immediately after this meeting, Day committed herself to, to the planning committee of the resulting Catholic Interracial Council in New York City, CICNY, whose goal, according to its archives, was to promote in every practicable way relations between the races based on Christian principles by creating better understanding in the public as to the situation, needs, and progress of the Negro group in America through the establishment of social justice and through the practice of mutual cooperation. A few months later, Day described in the worker her contributions to CICNY in terms of, and I'll quote her, a good deal of investigating of complaints as to churches, schools, and institutions where there is said to be discrimination against the Negro and to take up specific examples and try to rectify them. In 1935, just a year later, at the behest of a black Catholic activist in Chicago, Arthur Falls, who would become the first African-American executive secretary of the CIC in 1963, at his behest, the Catholic worker changed its masthead in its second issue, 
to include a black and a white worker reaching across the cross, perhaps a reflection of what Commonweal Magazine at the time described, and I quote, a real awakening on the part of white Catholics in the wake of the CIC initiatives. Many Catholic historians and public intellectuals debate whether or not Day and the worker she helped to found were equally as concerned with reforming the church as they were with reforming society, part of futile efforts to plot her on traditional or progressive or conservative and liberal paradigms. But Day's work with the CICNY, which disbanded in the early 70s due to a pullback of support from the Archdiocese of New York, clearly indicates that she was concerned with reforming both, both the church and society when it came to racism, and she was very public about it. Second, perhaps it was the fact that she was a woman that allowed Day to see that injustice happens to inspirited bodies, to borrow the phrase from Yale's own Margaret Farley. Injustice is hunger, it's addiction, it's you and your body not being able to live or work in certain spaces. And Day knew that injustice and poverty does something to people's spirits in their, to their sense of self, which can be further demoralized by acts of paternalistic charity. The works of mercy, both corporal and spiritual, shaped the ethos of the worker. And one cannot do these works without encountering others in tactile meetings with embodied and inspirited suffering. Nor could it be done without encountering the depths of one's own spirit, one's deepest self. As a woman, Day, know, Day knew that we do justice with our bodies. She put her white body physically near other bodies that would have been considered non-white, either because of ethnicity or social class or skin color or political affiliation. And she did this both in order to better emphasize and understand what these folks needed or wanted, but also to allow her body to serve as a portal for the privileges awarded to it public attention during protests, safety during imprisonment, legitimacy when dealing with archbishops. And since she had a following among whites, where Day went with her body would shine a spotlight on what was happening to other bodies in those places. In an article in the New York Times Magazine about her cause for sainthood, biographer Paul Ellie noted, and I'll quote him, Day called her Catholic worker column on pilgrimage, and she crisscrossed the country by bus to visit Catholic worker houses, taking her breviary, her diary, and a jar of instant coffee. She went to Cuba to meet Castro and Rome to fast in St. Peter's Square for peace. Yet she was so identified with the Lower East Side that people would invariably show up at St. Joseph House and expect her to greet them at the door. Day did not shy away from the color line. In addition to regular activities of the CICNY chapter in Harlem, which included very revolutionary at the time, interracial liturgies and prayer breakfasts intended, and I'll quote from their archives, to actively challenge norms that contradicted church teachings. In addition to those things, one of her earliest trips from the worker in New York City was at the invitation of a Southern Tenants Farmers Union founded by Protestant ministers who were concerned with the plight a black tenant farmers. Decades later, she would visit the interracial community at Koinonia Farm in America's Georgia during a Lenten pilgrimage, where she hoped to learn from folks there about the violence of white supremacy. And she learned what it was like to be shot at during, the, during a, night, a night watch. It might have been that experience that shaped her explanation towards the end of her life about what she thought the many young people who contributed to the worker may have taken away with them. I'll quote her, they learn not only to love with compassion, but to overcome fear, that dangerous emotion that precipitates violence. They may go on feeling fear, but they know the means and they have grown in the faith to overcome it. Third, in the spirit of two others with whom she is named by the Pope, Day provides an exemplar of what white nonviolent struggle looks like. Catholic worker and Notre Dame ethicist Margaret, Margaret File notes that when it comes to resisting white domination, Day shows us that nonviolence is an interior disposition of letting go of an identity that is constructed for you, which for whites 
means emptying ourselves of a sense of our own righteousness, our own moral goodness and innocence, a sense that we are the ones with the answers or the resources, or the sense that our needs or the needs of our own fragile egos are more important than the needs of justice. Moreover, Day shows that nonviolence creates a space within individuals and collectives for a new capacity for relationships. This space for new relationships is what allows alternatives to the structural and systemic realities to surface and to be perceived by other people and to be perceived solutions to them as to be perceived as viable. Both of these things require ongoing clarification of thought that can best happen when your body is drawn near to the bodies closest to the pain of injustice. For Catholic workers, the soup line is the think tank in the seminar room, says Pat Jordan, an editor of Commonweal and a former Catholic worker. It's in the soup line that you make policy. In a pamphlet examining the workers' refusal to participate in air raid drills in Manhattan in 1955, Day lifts up the as of yet untapped prophetic strain of American patriotism with the potential to interrupt the logic of the status quo of her day and dare I say our own. We know what we are in for, she said, the risk we run in openly setting ourselves against this most powerful country in the world. It's a tiny Christian gesture. We do not wish to be defiant. We do not wish to antagonize. We love our country and are only saddened to see its great virtues matched by equally great faults. We are a part of it. We are responsible too. It's a message of critique and accountability, of naming wrongs and daring for the good. So I think that day illuminates a correlation between racial mercy and throwing open the doors of the upper room of whiteness in this jubilee year of mercy. And this becomes evident if we think about her in light of some of Francis's ideas about mercy. So let me give you a couple of these and then we can have a bit of a conversation. First, Day was no stranger to the need for God's mercy. And as such, her witness can compel Euro-Americans like her to take up the work of justice first by examining conscience, then by examining culture, and then by asking for forgiveness. Recall her visits to black communities in Patterson that I opened with, where she heard stories of awful racial violence. She concluded that diary entry by saying, we cannot talk of the love of God, the love of our neighbor, without recognizing the dire need for penance. In a world in which such cruelty exists, in which men are so possessed, such a spirit cannot be cast out but by prayer and fasting. For Day, mercy involved softening one's own heart so that ongoing critical self-reflection is possible. It's about the courage to embrace one's own short failings or short fallings rather than to deny or resist them and seeking forgiveness constantly. And perhaps returning to my first point about this, she engaged in public acts of penance that signaled both her limitations, but also her willingness to try again and again, fasting, protesting, marching, writing, praying the rosary. All of these were radical acts of self-love, a way of embracing her own sinfulness to seek mercy and then try again, a way of caring for ourselves that ethnic whites either lost or perhaps sacrificed in the process of becoming white in America. Self-love that leads to a desire for forgiveness and the confidence to start again can turn the power dynamics at the heart of much social justice, social injustice on its head. And I think the Pope echoes this. If we do not begin by examining our wretchedness, Francis says in the Church of Mercy, if we stay lost and despair that we will never be forgiven, we end up licking our own wounds and they stay open and never heal. Francis suggests that the desire for forgiveness or even an acknowledgement that we're sorry, that we're not more sorry about something is all it takes to awaken us to the reality of a merciful God who sees us, each of us, as beloved. Francis is tactile and embodied in his descriptions of mercy, much like Dorothy. He often uses it in a verb form in Spanish, mercifying, he calls it. It's a caress, a verbal or embodied expression of care, a tenderly applied dose of medicine. By acknowledging our sinfulness when it comes to racism, 
rather than sidestepping it, we can undo the paralyzing bindings of rejection or denial or voluntary ignorance that keep Euro-Americans locked up in defensive postures around our brothers and sisters of color. Much in the way that mercy can transform a church that is healthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security, to use Francis's words, into one that is bruised, hurting, and dirty, Mercy might allow Euro-Americans to become, in the words of Emory philosopher George Yancey, vulnerable or unsutured or undone by the ugliness of our white supremacy. And lastly, Servant of God, Dorothy Day, occupies both spaces, the upper room and the world outside, suggesting that we need mercy in both places. She is with us whites, especially white Catholics, on the inside of that locked door in the upper room of fear. And she's standing on the, um, among those on the other side, the farm workers organizing for better pay, the mothers fasting for an end to armed conflict, the incarcerated seeking rehabilitation and not retribution, the college students marching to protest a militized police, the faithful protesting the death penalty. She is one who can open wide the door of mercy, inviting us whites to cross over into the messy and yet beautiful space of the wounded resurrection, inviting us to probe the wounds of the resurrected Jesus within ourselves and the people around us. Moral theologian James Keenan suggests that mercy is the virtue that enables us to enter into the chaos of other people's lives. As such, racial mercy becomes the ability for white Christians in the United States to move beyond the security of the upper room and out into the dangerous chaos that sustaining white supremacy has created in our individual lives, our white communities, as well as the wider community. In the Church of Mercy, Francis notes, and I'll quote him, whenever we Christians are enclosed in our groups, our movements, our parishes, in our little worlds, We remain closed, and the same thing happens to us that happens to anything that's closed. When a room is closed, it begins to get dank. If a person is closed up in that room, he or she will become ill. Whenever Christians are enclosed in their groups, parishes, and movements, they take ill. With the help of mercy, the work of justice becomes a pilgrimage, a way of moving out of ourselves, moving to the outskirts of our emotional or intellectual or political or spiritual or liturgical comfort zones, buoyed by the security that we get, we know, that by, the, by the security of knowing that when we get it wrong, and we do and we will, that we can acknowledge it. We can seek forgiveness from God and others. We can try again. With, with mercy, we are able, again, in the words of George Yancey, to tarry with our whiteness, recognizing that justice is not a destination when it comes to racism, but a way of being in the midst of the historical legacy of white domination. So in conclusion, in his papal bull announcing the Jubilee Year of Mercy, Francis notes the link between mercy and justice. He says, Mercy is not opposed to justice, but rather expresses God's way of reaching out to the sinner, offering him a new chance to look at himself and believe. And later, he notes, God does not deny justice. He rather envelops it and surpasses it with an even greater event in which we experience love as the foundation of true justice. Dorothy Day is clearly a continuation of an event for American Catholics, particularly at this moment in our national and ecclesial history. As we howl over the sins which we share and seek racial mercy, we beseech, servant of God, Dorothy Day, pray for us. Thank you. I am really involved in trying to be really involved in justice work in the city of Philadelphia. My family it has very deep roots in the city of Philadelphia, going back um, at least four generations. So I know that my family is very uh, deeply connected to the racing of the city of Philadelphia and also uh, the Catholic Church's complicity and collusion um, in that. And I don't think that would make Philadelphia unique from any of the other cities on, uh, on the east or big cities, let's say even industrial cities like Chicago. Um, so one of the things that I um, am, am learning to do through uh, methods of community organizing, which are very new to me, 
um, is an idea that you draw closest to the people who are in the most pain because those are the folks who have the wisdom and also more often than not have the, the, the fortitude and the resilience to continue the struggle that they've been in long before I arrived or other folks arrived. Um, so it's a way of thinking about the preferential option for the poor in a way, but what I see being different and I think is different also with, with Dorothy Day um, is a sense of uh, respecting the agency and the dignity and the beauty of the folks with whom, with whom you work. Uh, and um, embracing those folks with a kind of humility, recognizing that they are the, they are the, the, the wisdom figures and the folks uh, with a sense of, of what's really wrong and a sense also of an imagination that's informed by what could be possible in a way that me at the center of lots of forces of privilege and power can't see. Uh, and I think the more I, the more I dig around, and I've just started to do some archival work, I wouldn't even call it archival work, just looking at folks who have done archival work on the, um, the CIC in New York City, I think there are a lot of resources there. Because uh, I think one of the challenges in not knowing the ugliness of our history of race in the United States, we also don't learn of the beautiful forms of resistance that happen in lots of different communities. I don't think that most folks, you know, this is, there are not a lot of folks in looking at uh, the Catholic worker movement or looking at Dorothy Day wanting to examine her as sort of a white ally. Um, so that's a kind of a long-winded answer, but I think being rooted in that history, my family's history, and being close to people who are struggling with the, the dynamics of racism in Philadelphia has been really very important to me, and I feel like I could follow an example in Dorothy Day in, in doing that. Well, I appreciate you saying that and lifting up sort of the pain of addiction and the shame of, of addiction. I, I kind of skipped a last point for the sake of time, so I'm going to take your question as an opportunity to make that point right now. A third thing that I think Dorothy Day's notion of mercy brings to our understanding of justice is healing. Um, and that idea of healing, uh, healing justice comes from uh, the Black Lives Matter movement sees their spiritual work as healing, healing the wounds and healing the hurts that allow people to come to this work as full selves, recognizing that those wounds on bodies of color and on white bodies often are the drivers of addiction in many ways. Um, and that healing justice really is about attending to, the, attending to wounds and making people whole before they can head out and do, do the work of justice. Uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement pulls from a lot of indigenous traditions. Um, and if we think about indigenous peoples being the first to really experience in very awful ways European dominance or white dominance, I'm interested in going back in and now looking at some of the writings out of indigenous populations on healing the wounds, spiritual wounds and physical wounds of, of the legacy of, of white dominance. So thank you for that. And I'm not sure about Dorothy Day and work with indigenous populations or how they might have been on um, her radar screen. I know at the founding, um, Lafarge's work um, around this Catholic interracial council, he did um, reach out to Mother Catherine Drexel, St. Catherine Drexel, a Philadelphian, um, who was engaged in, in ministries to uh, Native Americans and folks of color, particularly the latter in, in Philadelphia. Um, but her model was very much rooted in a sort of charity model, which was not what Lafarge was really about or thinking about. So I need to look and, and see you know, how this, where that might surface or bubble up in, 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 looking at, um, in looking at Dorothy Day. I think much like he did with racism in the United States, I feel as though Francis verbally dances around many of these issues. I think he is astute. I don't, I, I think he's, he's prudent, but I also think he's prophetic. Um, and in his recent visit to Mexico, the way in which he um, has embraced indigenous culture, language, dress, customs. In, in Evangelii Gaudium, he talks about culture and the vibrancy of culture and the multicultural nature of the church being what we can use to resist an economy of exclusion. 
which, you know, tools for empowering evangelization that embraces the spirit of Pentecost. Um, I think even him asking, acknowledging the church's collusion in Latin America and South America in the racing of people um, and in the destruction of indigenous people and cultures and land, I think is is an important first step, but I hear you saying that more like it, that we have to kind of keep the pressure on or continue to press um, press for that. Yeah. And this was the place where Dorothy Day was unequivocally critical of 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 the church around this question of around the question of the black white question of race um, in New York City. But I, I think I, I hear you, so that's good. I now have to. I've got more work to do. And we'll take questions afterwards individually, but thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thank you.